Welcome to the Let's Think Show. This is your host, Shepard, the Voluntarist. Welcome back for another episode. Uh, This is January 2021, and uh, this will be my last month here on KHNC 1360. So uh, please do tune in again next week, and then we'll be winding down and going to a podcast format thereafter. And for those of you listening to me on YouTube or podcast format, hello, even if it's months later, uh, welcome to the show. I thought we'd start out today uh, chatting about something that I am pretty passionate about, and that is the the idea of voluntarism. And and some of you might not have heard of this. Uh, It's a philosophy that I really care a lot about. And uh, over the years, I've researched a lot of things. I was once a Republican, and before that, I didn't really know or care. And and then I just kept reading and digging and researching and, and looking into my own heart and kind of came to the conclusion that there was a better way than the, the Republican Party that I'd been a part of. Uh, I, I realized, yeah, there, there, there are some things that aren't perfect or even very good uh, with the party. I realized that it was corrupt. I realized that uh, if people really did what the party said, it would be better. But there were still a few things that I thought, no, even if even if people did what they said and and really wanted to lower taxes and and less spending and and smaller government and I, even if all of that happened, it still wasn't perfect, at least from a moral perspective. And so then I thought about, uh, eh, well, what's better? And so I'm going to share with you some of the uh, some of the answers that I found. You know, I, I asked myself, uh, why am I voting? Uh, if I was going to vote and the politician said, uh, I'm not going to control anybody else. I'm only going to control you, and I'm only going to tax you and take your money away, Shepard. I'm not going to tax anybody else. I'm not going to tell them what to do. It's just you. Will you please vote for me so that I can do that to you? And I thought, well, no, of course not. Are you crazy? Why? Why would I? Why would I ask somebody to tell me what to do and to take my money away from me? Uh, now, I mean, I'm not even just making suggestions. Hey, you might want to spend it on this. No, actually take it from me against my will. And I thought, this doesn't make sense. And then I thought, that's basically voting. It isn't asking the politician to do something to you. It's you telling the politician, hey, I want you to do this to my neighbors. And I said, that ain't right. That's wrong. That's just morally wrong. I wouldn't want my neighbor doing that to me. That's, you know, what is the, the, the old saying? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Well, if that golden rule is, is really a good idea, then it would seem to me that I shouldn't ask somebody to take money away from my neighbors against their will. Or to tell my neighbors what they can and can't do, whether it's building a a porch without a permit or uh, whatever it is that they might want to do that's not hurting other folks. Why would I ask somebody to control them? And I and I realized, I think I'm a better person than that. I, I, I think I think I shouldn't be doing that. And that was part of the journey to voluntarism. And so a few of the things that that voluntarism is. And I'll just kind of go down a list of of seven things here that are kind of the the foundations of voluntarism. And of course, each voluntarist, just like each person in any group that has an ism or an ist (laughs) that describes who they are, they'll say, well, no, that's not a real Christian. A real Christian believes blah, blah, blah. Or, well, that's not a real Democrat. A real Democrat believes this or that. So I'm not going to say my answers are all Perfect. I'm just going to give you a rundown of of my understanding of of what voluntarism is. And kind of the first thing is self-ownership. We believe that we own ourselves. We own our own bodies. 
Uh, we were born free without any debt or there's no mortgage on our bodies or on the fruits of our labor. So if I'm born free and I go out and work hard and create whatever it is that day, a sharp stick or whatever I can create, that is mine. And I have title to me and to that which I produce, uh, including if I'm trading my time to somebody, the the fruits of my labor, the the what I'm paid for my time, all of that belongs to me, not just 99%, but all of that belongs to me. And my body belongs to me 100%. I own me. And, and that is kind of a, a big part of voluntarism is kind of accepting that right off the bat that, no, I, I'm i not just a cog in the wheel. I, I, I'm not a piece of the machine of society. I, I'm part of society, but I am an individual. I am me. So that self-ownership is is kind of the, the number one part of voluntarism. And uh, the next thing is kind of this idea that uh, we're not going to initiate violence against others is the best way to put it. And and some people will call that the NAP, the non-aggression principle. You probably heard of that. And, and this idea is that there's nothing wrong with violence. And when I say that, think about a, a woman getting attacked in a dark alley and, and some guys are there trying to rape her and they attack her. I want her to be very violent. I want her to defeat them soundly through greater violence than they could ever dream of. So it's not violence that a voluntarist is opposed to. It's the initiation of violence. And we often extend that. And maybe the words, it's just a word game, but maybe it's not perfect. But I extend that to say you have to respect other people's property. You can't do violence to their property. In other words, you can't you can't go with a hammer and beat their car in or steal their car from them or defraud them through forgery or you can't extort them or rob them or or kill them. Uh, you have to respect their their property as well as their person. And so that's kind of the the non-aggression. You're not going to aggress against people or their property. Uh, that That's the non-aggression principle. And that's kind of sort of all it is, except there's another distinction. Uh, you, you've certainly heard of anarcho-capitalism, and, and that is another philosophy. And so people say, well, is that the same as voluntarism? And voluntarism has one additional step or aspect, and that is that voluntarists don't believe in voting or participating in the electoral process, the political process, the voluntarist believes that doing so, if you vote for the lesser of two evils, you're still condoning the system that is doing something evil. And so just like you wouldn't vote for one child molester that's not quite as bad as another child molester, because you're not going to condone that kind of disgusting behavior, you, you wouldn't condone the behavior of, of any government, even if it was tiny and just what some folks back in the late 1700s thought it should be. Even that, you would say, no, uh, I, I, I've i looked at this deeply morally and to tax even a tenth of 1%, taxes, taking something from somebody against their will. And if you look back at voluntarism, no, we don't steal. So you couldn't even do that at all. So those are kind of the foundations of voluntarism. I'm, I'm going to look here at my notes and see what else. Uh, you know, I, I think th there's a, a part that I wouldn't say has to be part of voluntarism, but almost every voluntarist believes or it's their impression or understanding is that there's no such thing as a social contract. You know, not one that somebody else invented and thinks exists. So in other words, if uh, who's the guy that made the documentary about the Federal Reserve? It's Aaron Russo. Uh, if Russo came up with a social theory uh, or a social contract that he thought existed, well, no, that's it's it's not a contract. It's a preference. 
because a contract has to have a number of things in order to be a contract. Uh, and, and maybe we'll go over those in just a little bit when we get back from the break. But a, a contract isn't just, hey, I think everybody ought to be nice to each other. That's not a contract. That's a preference. And we can't hold somebody else to our preference. My preference is that everybody gives me some some good caramel ice cream, that really fatty stuff, except I don't want to gain any weight from it. That, that's my preference. But a preference preference isn't anything. It's just it's just something you you kind of want and you wish would happen, uh, whether or not it's likely to happen. It's just it's just a preference. It's different than a principle. It's different than a, a contract. Uh, all these words or, or these concepts have very different meanings. What do you think of when you think of a contract? Uh, don't you think of some specific parts of it? Like if you think of a contract to marry somebody, the agreement you make there, or the contract to buy a house, or to sell a car, or make some big business deal selling some good or service to somebody else and and you're doing a contract or you're leasing property, uh, real property or equipment or anything like that. There are certain things that you have to have in order for it to be a lease. Let, let's talk more about the elements of a contract. The first element of a contract is that there has to be an offer. And by the way, there are seven parts of a contract. And, and I'm going to kind of go down my list here. So the first is the offer. Somebody has to offer somebody something. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you that, uh, this car, if you'll give me a hundred dollars. And then the number two thing is there has to be acceptance. There has to be acceptance of the offer. So if I said, I'll give you the car, you give me a hundred bucks. The other person has to say, yep, I'm good with that. Let's do it. And there can be negotiation back and forth, but you have to end at the place where there is, uh, uh an acceptance. And, and and that acceptance is kind of goes into number three, mutual assent. Uh, this has to be something that both sides are awake and aware of what's going on. It can't it can't be fooling somebody when they're drunk or asleep or three years old or uh, mentally retarded. And it, like from a, a clinical sense, you, you can't just do it if you're the only person that really knows what's going on. So both parties have to be free of coercion and, you know, decide that that's what they want to do. And then there has to be consideration. That's number four. And the consideration would be uh, for me giving the car to you. The car would be one bit of consideration. The other consideration would be the hundred bucks. So if there wasn't something going back and forth, then that's that's a necessary element. You have to have that. If you don't have that, it's not a contract. It might be a gift. If I said, here's a car, and there was no consideration you had to give me, then it could be a gift. That would be acceptable. But it's not a contract. So that has to exist. And there has to be capacity. Uh, the person has to be capable of making uh, making this deal. And that's it, kind of similar. We talked about mutual assent, uh, the meeting of the minds. It's, it's kind of similar to that. We both have to be completely on board with a thing. It can't be done in our absence or on our behalf or something like that. We have to be there and in the thick of things and agreeing to it and, and completely on board. Um, and there has to be, and this is number six, there has to be an intention uh, to create this legal relationship, to, to make this deal. Uh, it has to be above board. Both parties have to agree. I intend to enter into this contract. And then the seventh thing is uh, legality. It has to be legal in the area in which you reside. Now, I'm going to just say that I'm going to forget number seven, because as a voluntarist, um, I believe more in doing what's right and what's moral and what's good. And I don't care so much what Men that wear black dresses and have hammers that they bang on a desk and and what the, the government officials I, I, we're talking about morality today. So if you were going to talk about legal stuff, yeah, maybe all that would matter, but and not not for the purpose of our conversation today. And so now we're looking at this this six step. I've I've made it from seven step, these six elements that have to be there in order for a contract to exist. And if you look at uh, a social contract, this idea of a social contract, none of them are there. Well, you maybe have an offer. Maybe somebody says, hey, uh, since you live in this society and other people walked on this path before you did and beat it down, you therefore owe society 50% of all of the income you ever produce. Well, <laughs> okay, we have an offer. Uh, only a 
person who had the wool pulled over their eyes, as far as I can tell, would say, hey, that sounds like a good deal. Well, no, that's not that's not a contract. If you only have an offer, you don't have acceptance or mutual assent, consideration, capacity, or the intention to form this legal relationship. You don't have a contract. And so the voluntarist believes that we're born free. We don't have a debt to society. Society doesn't have a debt to us. If we choose not to go out and work hard and save up money, then we don't just suddenly deserve whatever it is that that money could buy. We have to go out and earn it. And and that might be a an unpopular position, the voluntarist position of of don't steal no matter what, 100% complete intellectual uh, consistency. You know, we can't say, well, well, yeah, but you have to steal a little bit in order to, no, you, you can't be, you can't cheat on it. If you're going to believe in a moral principle, you have to stick with it. And that is essentially what a voluntarist has, has concluded for themselves. Is that something that makes sense to you? And of course, I know you understand what I'm saying, but is that something that you think is good for your life? Is that a is that a clear view of the world? Is that a good worldview? Or is it, are there flaws? Is it, in fact, uh, a bad idea to not initiate violence? Is it a good thing to initiate violence? Is it good to steal from people? Is it, uh, is it good to have relationships that aren't voluntary? Is it good to believe in the commune and the commune owes me and I owe the commune and and I'm not a free, independent, sovereign human being? Is it is that a better way? To me, it seems like all of these things that I'm talking about, this freedom, seems to me like it's a really good idea. And many of us have been fooled. I think it's being fooled. We've we've been told that freedom is something that it isn't. Because if we all asked, if if we asked the average person, do you believe you're free? They'd say, absolutely. Said, you live in a free country? Absolutely. So then you can go and get married without getting permission from the government? Well, no, you can't get married, but but you could go and 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 build a, a an extension on your on the back of your house without getting a permit, right? Well, no, no, you can't do that. Well, you could at least drive a car down to the hardware store to to pick up the equipment to to build this house or this extension, right? Well, no, you'd have to have a permit to drive there. Well, you could at least just take any car you wanted and just drive it down there, right? Well, no, you'd have to have the car registered. Wow. Doesn't sound so free. And I've just I'm just skimming the surface. And then I think about all the taxes. And I don't care if it's a red or a blue person taking my hard-earned money from me. Is that okay with you if somebody steals your money or or takes it? I think they they prefer the word tax because it doesn't sound as harsh as steal but in fact if you take something from somebody and 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 it's not rightfully yours you're you're stealing you're a thief well is that okay with you that people do that that anybody does that to you even if you agree in part with how they're going to spend it and even if you don't think that they are a bureaucratic uh mess they're going to take 100 bucks and get 10 dollars worth of stuff done with it of the good stuff you want, even if you didn't mind all that waste that that governments do, would it be okay to steal it? Don't you reckon maybe it would be better if they came to you and said, hey, do you want to chip in for this or that or the other thing? And then what if you said, yes, I do, but I'm concerned that my neighbor is not going to also chip in for that. So I would like you to go over and force my neighbor to chip in money for what it is that I want and what you want, but what my neighbor doesn't want. I know that sounds ludicrous, but isn't that what is really happening? I think it is. And gosh, as a Republican, I really believed. I thought, you know, it's the system we have. And if you if you don't like getting stolen from in that part of town, don't go to that part of town. And then I, I asked myself, wait a minute. Do I really believe that the victim 
should change where they are, where they walk, where they exist, where they live? Should I really say, no, you don't get to walk down that alley because there are a lot of thieves there. And if you do walk down there and you get stolen from, it's your fault. No, that alley didn't belong to the thieves. I mean, they might have stolen money in order to pay a construction company to build the alley, but it's not their alley. That's your alley. You're a human being. You get to walk where you want to walk. As long as you're not trespassing on somebody else's property, their private property, you get to walk there. You shouldn't be ashamed of yourself. You shouldn't say, well, I I disagree. I don't agree 100% with every way that they're spending my money. So I'm going to go ahead and just leave and go to a different country. No. You go to the other country, I would say to the folks who want to steal from me or tell me what to do. No, you're a thief. You don't tell me to leave. You leave. Right? Am am I off base here? Is that really the standard that I believe in? This is what I'm asking myself. Years ago, as I'm becoming a, a voluntarist, as I'm leaving my Republican roots And going to voluntarism, I'm asking myself all these questions. What is right? What isn't right? Uh, Are these the decisions I want to make? Is this the person who I really am? And I I hope you're asking yourself these questions. And and you might come to the same conclusion as I do. You might come to a different one. I'd love to hear from you. I'd I'd love to see what you have to say. Leave a comment on SoundCloud, our our podcast platform, or or go to letsthinkshow.com and uh, find us that way. And and let me know what you think. It, It sure does seem pretty clear to me, though, that for my life, I shouldn't steal from somebody. I shouldn't ask somebody else to steal from them. I should, if I'm brave, I should stand up and not let them steal from me. And and then I ask myself, has any of this changed? Because I say that all of these things happening, well, it's not an individual doing it. It's the government. Does that make it okay? I'm going to tell you what I went through. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the steps that I experienced as I made a difficult switch from what I had believed and I thought I knew for so many years. And I'm going to go over a few of the questions that I had to ask myself, or some variation of these questions. And and I had to ask these questions and then give myself honest answers. And there were times that I would ask a question and say, am I being consistent? Is this true all the way across the board? Or am I making excuses? As I am, I saying things like, well, you know, for the most part, well, but you have to sometimes bend a little bit. No, you can't bend on principles, can you? I hope not. I hope we can compromise on preferences, but I hope we wouldn't compromise on principles. So as I went through this, I had to kind of recognize that some of my principles were opposed to other principles. And then I had to ask myself, and and I came up with certain answers. Your answers might be different, but I had to come up with answers and figure out which one was better. One of the the big questions that I think is, is worth looking at is this question of whether or not you should obey a law if your moral conscience is opposed to it. So if there's something out there, if there's a law, and I'm just going to use an example, and you can think, has there ever been any law that you can think of that you think it would have been morally wrong to obey it? And I think one law might have been uh, back in the the slave ownership days in the United States, uh, there was a law that you couldn't give aid to runaway slaves. That was an actual crime. Uh, If they came sneaking across your property and you said, oh, come in here and get some sleep and eat some food and, you know, uh, you're thrilled that you you had the guts to risk your life to try to escape, come in here, let me take care of you. That was a crime. That was against the law. The cops would have come and arrested you. And, And I don't mean that in an offensive way. And I know there are a lot of people that like those flags with a blue stripe on them, the black flags with a blue stripe and support our police. But 
I guess what I'm saying, uh, police obey whatever they're told to do. They don't get to make decisions about what's morally right or wrong. But I'm asking you the same question I, I ask myself. If a law conflicts with my own moral conscience, should I disobey it? And I came to the conclusion that, yes, it really is up to me. And whether it was the slave example, helping a runaway slave, or other laws, and there are so many of them, that I go, no, you know, that's that's not what's morally right. I should follow my own conscience. But what about you? Do you think that even if you believe, and I'm not saying you have to go by what I believe is right or wrong, but if you believe that's a bad law, that law that, do you think you should put your own beliefs and moral conscience ahead of it, or just obey it blindly? Just be submissive, lower your eyes and say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm submissive. I'm obedient. Uh, What do you think? I I came to my conclusion. And then the kind of the follow-up to that is, under what circumstances do I think that disobedience to a law is morally, not legally, but morally justifiable. And who gets to make that decision? Is Do I think I'm something special where all of a sudden I can decide that I know better than the, the politicians in Birmingham who made the law that you have to report runaway slaves and you can't give them aid? Do I think I know better than them? Should I follow my own moral conscience? Or should I say no? Joey Biden is going to be the president, and I am going to follow what he believes is morally right. I'm not going to make my own choices. I came to my conclusion. uh, I came to the conclusion that it does have to have to pass my own moral tests. Has to pass the stink test. Has to be something that I think you know. I think I think I can sleep well at night if I do the right thing. And turning in a runaway slave or refusing him a glass of water, even though it's the legal thing, it's not the morally correct thing. And the person who gets to decide is me. And and I'm proud of that now. I'm proud that that I'm willing to stand up and say, even if I don't have the guts to act on it at a particular time, at least I can stand up and say, no, I, I, I know in my heart of hearts, that I am the person who's responsible for making decisions about what's right or wrong and and what I think is okay. That's a good feeling. It's It's a good feeling to know that you're in control of, if not every aspect of your physical life, at least you get to decide what is morally right or wrong. And some people turn to a religious scripture. I'm not saying that's bad. If you get your guidance from Uncle Bill or from God or from a book, it's none of my business where you get your your worldviews from, as long as they're clear and logical and well thought out and, and you stay morally principled and intellectually consistent, not up to me where you get those ideas. So if you get those ideas from whomever it is you trust, it is up to you to make that final call, I think. Then I ask myself, if it's bad for me to do a thing, if it's bad for me to take some action, is it morally okay for me to just ask somebody else to do that same thing? Is that okay? And and uh, thinking of an example, let's think of uh, let's think of of punching a two year old. Uh, child who's out playing in the yard, being really nice and cute, just walking up to him and punching him in the face. And I happen to believe that that's a bad thing to do. And I hope you agree. If I walk up to the kid and say, no, you know what? That's morally wrong for me to do. But I'm going to hire somebody else to do it for me. Does that change that act of punching the two-year-old? Does it change it from a moral thing? into a, uh, from an immoral thing? Does it change it from being a bad thing? If I hire someone else, does it change it into a moral thing? And I have to add, no, that doesn't change it. It doesn't 
something can't be made okay just because you hire somebody else to do something that you think is wrong. And then I thought, well, does it make it okay if a bunch of your neighbors think it's okay, but you still think it's wrong? Is it okay if your neighbors all get together and pool some money and hire somebody to come over and punch the two-year-old? Well, no. I I came to the conclusion that if a thing is morally wrong, for me, I can't hire an agent to go do it. And even if I get a bunch of people to agree with me that we're going to hire an agent, and even if they all think it's morally okay, in my heart, I know it's not. I know it's not okay to punch a two-year-old in the face. And so I kind of have to think about that as an absolute at this point. I mean, I've thought about it enough that it it seems to me to be pretty cut and dried. What do you think? Uh, Would you agree that that's a a cut and dried idea or am I off base there? Is it okay to just delegate doing a bad thing to somebody else? Now, I I don't want to steal the from the bank. I don't want to be a bank robber. That would be wrong, but I'm going to hire you to go rob the bank. Well, no, that to me, it sounds, uh, yeah, borderline silly. (laughs) I think it just doesn't make any, any sense at all. Uh, And then another question is if none of us have the right to do something or we all think it's bad, what step could we take to make it okay to do that thing. Is there anything? We've agreed we can't just delegate that that right that we don't have to do something bad. We can't just delegate that right to someone else. And even if it wasn't bad, if I don't have the right to do something, can I delegate that right even if it's not a horrible evil thing? Can I delegate a right that I don't have to someone else? I would think that that I couldn't do that. I would think that that would be a a wrong choice. We are talking about voluntarism, and that is different than volunteerism. Volunteerism is when you you kind of donate your time to do something. Voluntarism has more to do with being voluntary about everything and refusing anything that isn't completely voluntary. So if it's if all parties aren't uh, okay with something, you don't do it. So that's what we've been talking about a little bit, and. I've been sharing with you some of the questions that I went over years ago when I made the switch from from being a Republican uh, to being a voluntarist. Some of the questions that I had to ask myself and and come up with answers for, and I'm hoping you'll ask yourself these questions. And of course, I hope you agree with me. But if you don't, you could well be right. I could be wrong. Uh, it's up to you what you decide, uh, as long as you're being honest and true with yourself. And I think consistent. Uh, you can't say, you know, I don't want big government. I want small taxes. And then say, well, I'm okay with big government and lots of taxes as long as they're buying what I want with the money. <laughs> that's that's not intellectually consistent. Uh, if you do believe that, then in the beginning, you should say, I believe in a lot of taxes in a very strong central government as long as it's doing what I want it to do. That would be a very intellectually consistent position to hold. It'd be different than what I believe, but hey, who knows? I could be wrong. At least you're sticking with your intellectual uh, way of thinking. Now, of course, it's not intellectually inconsistent to get new information, get new knowledge, contemplate something deeply, and then make a better decision. That's that's being consistent. You're not staying consistent on the one thing you once believed, but hopefully part of your process is constantly looking at the things you think you believe or that you once believed and, and coming up with better, better answers, better solutions. That's how we get better as humans, isn't it? So here's a, here's a question that I had to ask myself. Do I believe that the same rules or the same idea of what is right and what is wrong, do do they apply the same to everybody or do they apply differently to different individuals or to an organization? Would an organization have a different 
set of rules. And and I guess going back to the, the silly example I gave earlier of punching a two-year-old child in the face who's just out minding their own business playing in the yard, is that something that uh, – is that a, a universal rule that you and I could agree, eh, it's wrong to do that? Uh, does that rule apply to everybody or does it just apply to one person or one group of people? And can there be different rules? Can there be a rule that – you know, it's okay for, for white folks to be out at any time of the day they want, but it's better if the black folks get home by dark. Is it okay to have different rules for different groups of people or however you base those? Or or should things apply across the board? If it's a okay for a human being to be out at any point they want, which I think we would all agree it is, then... Wouldn't it be okay for all human beings to be out at any point they want? And just because you're a member of a group or an organization or you have a particular characteristic, that doesn't change whether or not it's okay. That That's the conclusion I came to. Yours might be different, but that's what I kind of came to the conclusion of. And then I, then I ask, is there any way that people can change something that is wrong, an immoral act? And even if it's just subjectively immoral, in my opinion, it's immoral. In your opinion, it's immoral. Can people change that into a moral act without changing the act itself? So we could say, how could you you change this example of punching the two-year-old in the face? Uh, could you, how can you change that into a moral act? Well, if you if you don't punch him or you don't actually touch him, well, that's changing the act itself. So. This question that I ask myself is, if I don't change the act and it's still a full-fledged, good, hard punch to the face, is there anything that people can get together and decide and vote on and make motions and resolutions? And can we change if it's a good or bad thing? Or does it just remain a bad thing? Well, I know what conclusion I came to, and you can probably guess what it is. I'm guessing it's the same one that you come to as you follow this mental exercise, and I ask myself, if I believe in democracy, making the world, is it Bush that said, make the world safe for democracy, spread democracy, if I believe in democracy, which is the crowd is always right, if there if there's 51% of people, they are always right, or we have to do what they say, if I really truly believe that, then is there anything that it would be wrong for this majority to do? So if if 51% of the people or 99% of the people in an area agreed it's okay to punch little two-year-olds in the face, uh, is there any limit to what a majority can decide? Or, or is as long as we have a, a 51% or greater, 99% or greater, 80%, whatever it is, uh, do they get to do whatever they want? If they use the the process that people a couple hundred years ago uh, laid out, and in the United States, that would be the, the U.S. Constitution. As long as people follow the Constitution, is it okay or is it possible morally for the majority of people to make something that is wrong suddenly right because they all vote on it? And if it isn't right, which well, that was a conclusion I came to, you're probably thinking of the same thing. Well, then where where are the limits to that? Is there anything that a a majority can say if, if it's not as serious as punching a kid in the face? If it's if it's something much lighter hearted, uh, is it a can the majority all deciding something change whether or not that thing is good or bad? I. I got to tell you, I, I came to the conclusion that it's not possible. If it's, if it's wrong, it's still wrong. Uh, even if even if you can get a bunch of people to vote one way or the other on it. And then here's a question that that gave me some heartburn. And if you're listening to this and you're, you're a, a lefty or you're a righty, I'll give an example that might uh, kind of hit home for, for those two groups. And, and if you're part of the other 80% that, of people who just kind of 
want to mind their own business and don't want to tell anybody what to do and don't want to steal from each other. They just kind of want to get along to get along. See which of these examples might mean more to you and, and go along with that. So let's say that there's a law that says, or there's a tax that is part of the part of the tax money goes toward abortions. And let's say that you are opposed to abortion. You think uh, abortion is wrong. You think it's it's not a good thing to kill unborn children while they're in the fetus stage. You feel that that's wrong. And you know that the money that's demanded of you is going toward paying for abortions. Do you think it's okay for the majority to force you to do that? And I'd even take it a step further. Do you think that if somebody isn't willing to pay, should they be told, hey, that's part of the rules of living this game in this land, and it, you're getting a lot of benefits out of it. You're not going to agree with everything. If you don't like this, pay up. We got a baby to go suck out of a stomach. You need to get paid up. And if you don't like it, get the heck out of here. Move to another country. Go to Somalia if you think you want to do things on your own. Or taking this example on the other side, what if you think that war is wrong? The All the Middle Eastern wars over the last 20 or 30 or 40 years or whatever, all of the, the meddling over there and all the, all the wars uh, against the, the Islamic folk. Let's, let's say you're on, on the political side that says, hey, that, that ain't right, man. Uh, we shouldn't go over and kill the, all those people and, and the ones that, I don't know, she is joking, but Janet Reno, when she said that, uh, you know, it's, it was worth it to kill. Uh, no, that wasn't Janet Reno. I apologize. That was, she's the one that did the church killing in Texas. I'm thinking of uh, Madeline Albright when she said, yeah, it was worth it to put all these rules in place that killed 500,000 children in the Middle East. Uh, do, do you, do you agree with that? And, and, and if that's where the money is going, and let's say you don't agree with it. You think we should not be over there. What all, what the old man say, Ron Paul, he says, you know, bring those troops home now. Don't even him and hog, get them home. If you believe that way, whether you're a Democrat or libertarian or whatever, do you think it's okay for everybody else to get together or 51% of them say, no, it's okay. We all, we all got together and, and we voted and we're, we're going to go kill some more folks and you need to go ahead and chip in some money right now. So we can go kill them. And if you don't like it, leave. If you don't love this country and what 51% of the people in this country who read mainstream newspapers and watch mainstream news and went to government schools for 12 years, if you don't go along with what these people are fooled into thinking is right, then you need to leave. Does that make good sense? And of course, I'm being biased. You can hear it in my sarcastic voice here. <laughs> um... Uh, but I think that kind of, am I off base or does that make a good bit of sense? Think about it. Maybe I'm wrong. Tell me if I am. Thank you for tuning in to the Let's Think Show. Let's chat again. Let'sthinkshow.com. Take care, my friends. Be good. Be good.